Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. There might be some uh, attendees still uh, joining the uh, uh, session. However, I think it would be uh, great to uh, get started because uh, we have a very exciting topic to uh, talk about uh, in this session of the UN Environment Programme course on multilateral environmental agreements. Um, my name is uh, um, Sander Chan. I'm a senior researcher, non-state action at the Global Center on Adaptation. I'm also adjunct assistant professor at Utrecht University and senior research and um, uh, a, a associate researcher at the German Development Institute. And I had a long, in, long time interest in um, the question of how to engage non-state actors in climate and environmental governance and increasingly also in biodiversity. Uh, that is why I'm uh, uh, so uh, uh, happy to have uh, Nico Urho here, uh, who will talk uh, about this on this topic, uh, reflecting on lessons learned from global commitment platforms and their relevance for the action agenda for nature and people. Uh, Nico is a senior research fellow in the Center for Governance and Sustainability uh, in the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He specializes in global environmental and sustainability governance, in particular, uh, sound management of chemicals and waste and conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Nico has a vast uh, global environmental policymaking experience and um, uh, previously he worked in the Ministry of the Environment of Finland. Nico has recently authored a report uh, on commitment platforms and the global agenda for chemicals and uh, waste management. In this report, he discusses international mechanisms for encouraging voluntary commitments, uh, as well as their functions and principles. He deliberates uh, on how such mechanisms could be part of addressing issues of concern in um, chemicals and waste management, for instance, uh, uh, on how to improve uh, the agenda for nature and people under the conventional uh, biological diversity CBD um, uh, in this session. Um, before uh, uh, Nico can take it away uh, from here with his um, lecture, his presentation, I would like to uh, point you to the possibility to ask your questions, to post your questions in the Q&A uh, chat. Um, we will uh, first have uh, uh, Nico's uh, lecture and then in about 30 or 40 minutes, we will have a Q&A session uh, 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 with your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you. Nico, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Nico Urhop. It's a pleasure for me to provide this lecture today on lessons learned from global commitment platforms and their relevance for the Action Agenda for Nature and People. Uh, the full name is, by the way, El Shaik Dukunming Action Agenda for Nature and People, but I'll use a more shorter name, Action Agenda for Nature and People. It was established in 2018 by CBD COP 2014 to generate voluntary action from non-state actors to complement the work of parties. The main questions guiding the lecture include, what are the key principles and functions that can be identified in existing global commitment platforms? And how can lessons learned from global commitment platforms benefit the action agenda for nature and people? And I have a structure that includes four main sections, introduction to commitment platforms, then the key principles and functions, and lastly, lessons learned. So the first section aims to introduce the 10 commitment platforms that I have been looking at uh, through the study 
mentioned by Sander and the philosophy behind them. So first, how did commitment platforms evolve? At the international level, sustainable development institutions took the lead in promoting voluntary commitments. In 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development adopted the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation. Uh, there are more than 200 multi-stakeholder partnerships for sustainable development were announced at the summit. The partnerships were collectively branded as type two agreements. In 2012, the Rio Plus 20 conference adopted the voluntary commitment system, which is conceptually broader than the preceding model based on the idea of partnerships, that is a union of different actors. And that then stimulated the development of the global registry of voluntary commitments, today known as the Partnerships for SDGs online platform, which is one of the 10 commitment platforms I have been looking at. Since the Rio Plus 20 conference, voluntary commitment platforms have expanded to cover almost all areas of sustainable development. Uh, this enables non-state actors to submit voluntary commitments to achieve sustainability goals at the same level with governments. Commonly, there has been little if any planning in mind when these platforms have been developed, so there has, it hasn't always resulted in the optimal outcome. And that's why it's important to consider the design of the functions when initiating any new global commitment platform. Uh, the figure also shows two commitment platforms that operate in conjunction with MEAs. In 2014, the new UNFCCC laid grounds for the Global Climate Action Agenda. And in 2018, the CBD initiated the Action Agenda for Nature and People, both endeavoring to attract action from non-state actors. So what are the benefits and challenges of commitment platforms? Uh, well, benefits include that they encourage voluntary measures that enable to go beyond regulatory compliance. Also, commitment platforms incentivize action by providing the needed visibility and recognition. And they also help to increase collaboration between different stakeholders. Challenges include difficulties in measuring performance, which, which is a persistent problem across almost all of the global commitment platform. And the reporting often focuses on qualitative information that cannot be aggregated. Also in many commitment platforms, the industry involvement is relatively low and there can be a risk for greenwashing if measures are not taken against it. Uh, this table provides key information of the 10 global commitment platforms that I have been looking at. As you see, most of the commitment platforms have emerged after the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012. The number of commitments range from 200 to almost 40,000. The number of commitments is growing rapidly, especially in the Global Climate Action Agenda and the UN Global Compact. And Coming to the coloring in this table, it shows the institutional host. The commitment platforms can support the achievement of MEAs, as shown in yellow, as I already mentioned. And this applies to the UNFCCC and the CBD that have these commitment platforms. And the most common institutional host is an intergovernmental organization, uh, shown with green. They can also be independent like our ocean conference shown there in the center with blue. And then lastly, as shown in red, the new plastics economy global commitment is hosted by Ellen, Mac Ellen MacArthur Foundation and in cooperation with UNEP. So it's kind of a hybrid model in that sense. This is the same table, but the coloring has been changed to show the target group of the commitment platforms. In top, in green, you can see that the UN Global Compact is only intended to attract businesses. And then in yellow, you can see the two platforms that are hosted by MEAs are both intended for non-state and sub-state actors. So this means basically everyone else except governments that are already parties to those MEAs. 
And in blue, you can see the platforms that are open to everyone. So most of these platforms are open to all governments and stakeholders. And again, the same table, but the coloring has been changed to show the form of the commitments. So in green, you can see that most, most platforms include a mechanism of providing open-ended commitments. But there are, of course, criteria that needs to be considered when making these commitments. And in yellow, you can see that the SEEDS action platform only includes partnerships. And in blue are shown platforms that require to become a signatory to comply with specific principles and standards. This includes the UN Global Compact, the new plastics economy global compact commitment and these attract a lot of interest from the private sector this model of, of becoming a signatory and i will now briefly introduce the action agenda for nature and people so as said in 2018 the cbd cop encouraged all stakeholders to make biodiversity commitments available to the action agenda it details are outlined in the launch announcement made by the COP president from Egypt and the future host from China. It outlines three objectives. It is to raise awareness, to implement nature-based solutions, and to catalyze cooperative initiatives by all stakeholders and sectors. And the Secretariat has developed an online platform to receive and showcase biodiversity commitments at the moment, there are 219 commitments in the platform. And the action agenda will require, require a further mandate from COP15. And it will be important to accommodate lessons learned. And just screenshots and graphics from the online portal show that the majority of the commitments are from academic and research institutes and also NGOs. And then this graphic shows the 11 action areas under which the commitments are grouped. And this is a screenshot from the online portal that shows that commitments are expected from four groups. So this is basically everyone else except the governments that should make commitment through the clearinghouse mechanism. And just a brief introduction to some of the global commitment platforms. Uh, I'm not going through all 10 of them, but look to a half a dozen of them. The first, the UN Compact uh, aims to commit signatory companies to align their operations with the 10 principles of human rights, labor, environment, anti-corruption when they become signatories. The strengths of this includes the establishment of local networks that are now in 68 countries. So they really help to anchor the action to the national level. This is something quite unique in these commitment platforms. And it is the only platform that has mandatory reporting for all of the signatories. Challenges include that the reporting format is qualitative and it doesn't enable to aggregate information and to show trends how companies are actually performing. And the Global Climate Action Agenda uh, is led by two alternating high-level champions appointed on behalf of the COP presidents in, our, in, in accordance with decision uh, one slash CP21 from 2015 from the Paris meeting. Uh, the strength include that it has a very interactive online registry called NASCA and it's partly driven due to the high level champions and it has broad engagement especially from municipalities almost half of all the commitments come from cities and municipalities the challenges include a relatively weak private sector involvement uh, of course, there are thousands of commitments from the private sector, but, but more could be expected. And it has been strug struggling to develop a reporting and accountability framework that could measure outcomes. 
the SIDS action platform is de dedicated to promoting partnerships for sustainable development in a small island developing, developing states in line with the Samoa pathway declaration from 2014. And the strengths include a very detailed government's framework. For example, it has an intergovernmental steering committee that meets annually to, to look at the work plan and so on. And it is one of the few uh, platforms that has developed a standardized reporting process. And also here in the platform, the emphasis is on assisting developing countries where the needs are the greatest. And challenges include very low reporting rates. Only 20% of the partnerships actually report. And our Ocean Conference is an independent, high-profile commitment platform organized annually by alternating host countries aiming to generate ambitious ocean-related commitments. Strength includes that, again, it's government-driven by the host countries. Proposals for commitments are validated before an announcement to ensure that they are substantive and significant, that they fulfill the criteria set for the commitments, and also the commitments are long-lived. They, they are active and they do just, just disappear, which is common for other registries. Uh, challenges include that it has an almost non-existent governance, governance structure. But of course, it can also be a strength because it doesn't have a lot of cost when the secretariat is just a handful of, of consultants working uh, in different places of the world. And then the UN Ocean Conference. It operates mainly through nine thematic communities of ocean action. And these communities are led by one IGO and one NGO um, representative to give it more a higher profile. And it aims to specifically implement SDG 14. And this Ocean Conference was a single event in 2017, but a new conference has been planned for 2022 for next year. The strength include that the UN General uh, Secretary General has appointed the Special Envoy for the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson, to lead advocacy efforts of the conference. So this has given it a face uh, and, and high level political attention that has been very important to attract these commitments. And challenges include that the conference was uh, initially a one-time event, and that has made it difficult to attract commitments after the conference. Then coming to the new plastics economy global commitment that, that is led unusually by a foundation, LM Arthur Foundation, in collaboration with UNEP, aiming, aiming to commit signatories to transform the global value chain of plastics. Strengths include that it has an outcome-based reporting that enables the preparation of an annual collective progress, progress report actually showing trends, quantitative trends, how governments and the private sector is performing in terms of, of um, transforming the value chain of plastics. And this is a unique hybrid model that speaks to both governments and the private sector. So UNEP is responsible for governments and then Ellen MacArthur Foundation is responsible for attracting commitments from the private sector. It is also guided by a set of time-bound targets and that is accompanied with the ambition mechanism meaning that gradually the targets of the commitment platform are made more ambitious. And it's also unique because it targets actors across the value chain, which has often been uh, challenging. Well, challenges include when you look at the annual progress reports, uh, they indicate that despite of all the strengths, that, that level of progress to date has been low, very slow. 
Then coming to the second uh, section that aims to answer what are the key principles and functions of global commitment platforms. Coming first to the principles shown in the center of the diagram in blue. Uh, and these are principles and uh, functions identified in the study by looking into the 10 commitment platforms. So what is, what is needed and expected to have an efficiently working global commitment platform. So the principles in the center are uh, transparency that can be generated by making information publicly accessible online to generate the trust and confidence needed. Credibility can be achieved when commitments are substantive and significant and you make sure that it doesn't lead to greenwashing. Accountability can be achieved when the achievements are reported regularly and the performance is also reviewed regularly. And leadership can be achieved when champions are identified and empowered at various levels. And lastly, inclusiveness can be generated by engaging all relevant stakeholders in all sectors. And these five principles can be given effect with a careful design of functions that are grouped in the four clusters shown with the green uh, circles. Starting from the top first, implementation needs to be guided with time-bound targets and action plans to generate broad commitment. And here assigning cooperative operative co-leads to action plans will further help in mainstreaming efforts. Then coming to the second one on the right, it's important to outline clear modalities for commitments. Uh, this includes four different functions. Uh, criteria, to first guide, guide the preparation of commitments, and then also to ensure proper validation of the proposals before making them public to see that they meet the criteria. And, the and then defining modalities, how to actually then launch these commitments so that it creates visibility. And then also peer learning. So what, what can actually these stakeholders then learn from each other uh, when it comes to best practices and challenges and so on. And then coming to that uh, bottom uh, circle. Third, it's important to ensure that the progress of commitments is monitored. And this includes, of course, as mentioned, reporting and collective review. And then lastly, outreach can help to reinforce the other elements. And this includes, of course, managing an online registry that showcases the commitments and then organizing public campaigns uh, to erase awareness. And this table then provides a summary of the main functions in 10 global commitment platforms. And it's very indicative, uh, so don't take it too seriously. Definitely more research is needed to look into this. Uh, all of these functions may be uh, realized with different levels of stringency, which is not shown here. For example, for the UN Global Compact, it's the only, only uh, commitment platform that has mandatory uh, reporting. Others have reporting too, but it's not as stringent. And the last, last platform listed here in the table is the Action Agenda for Nature and People showing that it fulfills some of the functions as shown in the yellow. And here are the main functions of, of the action agenda, the last row from, from the previous table. So first, the Secretariat has indeed outlined criteria for commitments that are pretty comprehensive. Uh, secondly, there is a learning that occurs through a lot of online events organized by the Secretariat and also a newsletter that is distributed uh, pretty regularly. And then lastly, the online registry for commitments that I showed to you previously, the screenshots. Uh, it's functional and it's organized in 11 action areas. Also other functions may have some initial thinking but are not uh, for the moment operationalized. 
And here it's important to note that the action agenda is still in its very early phase and the functions may be added as it evolves. And this is relevant in particular if it gets a stronger mandate in the COP15. COP and then coming to the third and last section that I aim to respond, how can lessons learned from global commitment platforms benefit the action agenda for nature and people? And I will elaborate this function by function. And I might be repeating a bit myself, uh, but it's just to um, give a stronger message to the most important issues for today's lecture. So I'll list the, these 10 functions starting uh, with the targets. So these time-bound targets uh, for the global commitment platform play an important role in encouraging aspiration. And they can also be accompanied with indicators that then enable to measure progress. And the best practice here includes the new plastics economy global commitments. As I said, it lays down a set of time-bound targets for achieving a circular economy for plastics by 2025. And it also has some sub-targets. And these targets constitute a minimum bar, bar that are regularly reviewed. And the level of ambition is raid, raised to ensure that the initiative continues to evolve over time. And the recommendation for the action agenda for nature and people is to use the targets of the Beyond 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework that will be agreed to guide uh, the commitments of different uh, non-state and sub-state actors. Uh, coming to the work plans that are developed uh, by commitment platforms, and they may take different forms, ranging from strategies to very detailed <clears throat> work programs. They may also be accompanied with working groups or task forces to assist in operationalization of the work plans. And here the best practices include the follow-up of the UN Ocean Conference in 2017. That, as I said, it developed these nine communities of, of ocean action. And each community is coordinated by two focal points from civil society and the UN system. And each of these communities is expected to organize regular webinars, meetings, and participate in reviewing progress. So it basically enables to mainstream a lot of the work. So it's not only the secretariat doing the work, but it's these nine communities of ocean action led by prominent figures from the UN system and civil society. And the recommendation for the action agenda is to delegate work to specific working groups and preparing dedicated work plans to guide their work. So these work plans could be either developed by the specific working groups, or then that could be, for example, the high level champions uh, by the host countries could also do work plans as an alternative option. Then the criteria for commitments aim to ensure that the commitments meet certain quality expectations. Most of the commitment platforms use so-called smart criteria, meaning that commitments need to be specific, measurable, achievable, resource-based, and time-bound. And here, best practices include the Global Climate Action Agenda that calls for co commitments with clear targets, or well, that is one of the criteria that, criteria, criteria that is specified. An analysis of 338 companies using science-based targets show that they have reduced their combined emissions by 25% since 2015. So at least this study shows that when you have actual targets with the commitments, uh, then the stakeholders are more committed to actually realizing their commitments. Uh, the recommendation for the action agenda is to complement existing criteria by asking commitments to include time-bound targets. And ideally, this would then be based on, on the targets that are to be agreed uh, in the Beyond 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework now under negotiation. 
and then coming to validation uh, of the commitment proposals, which is needed to ensure that they are in conformity with the criteria that has been set for them. This is actually very rare, as most of the commitments are actually posted as such online or may have just some initial uh, dialogue with the Secretariat. And here the best practices include the Race to Zero campaign established by the Global Climate Action Agenda uh, that aims to encourage net zero commitments from all stakeholders. And here an expert peer review group has been established to review these partner applications to make sure that actually this is not about greenwashing, but this is about real commitments uh, that are substantive and, and significant. And the recommendation for the action agenda for nature and people is to review proposals for commitments prior to the announcement using an independent expert panel to keep these standards constant. So it would be not based on the judgment of the Secretariat alone, but there would be a set of independent experts involved. And the launch of commitments often happens uh, in conjunction with these conferences uh, to ensure visibility and this functions as an important incentive for action and for actually pledging these commitments that you can speak in front of ministers and CEOs and so on. And the best practices include the Global Climate Action Agenda that organizes high level events during the second week of the UNFCCC COPs for launching these new commitments. So these high level events actually then enable uh, to speak with and in front of, of ministers to show action. And the recommendation for the action agenda for nature and people is to organize high level events during the CBD COP for announcing new commitments and then to help create political traction. And then coming to peer learning, and this is facilitated by organizing events to present and discuss challenges uh, in these conferences, or it can be uh, webinars organized by the Secretariat or different types of, of newsletters and so on. And the best practices here, again, include, I'm often referring to the Global Climate Action Agenda that actually is very, very relevant for the CBD because it organizes thematic action events and roundtables during the first uh, week of the COP so that you can talk uh, around the thematic priorities of the action agenda in these roundtables. And the relevance for the action agenda is to organize similar thematic sessions for the 11 action areas in conjunction with the CBD COPs for sharing these experiences and presenting achievements between partners, beneficiaries and other stakeholders. And then reporting on performance is fundamental for tracking progress. It should focus on quantitative data to understand outcomes and impacts. And best practices here include the UN Global Compact that requires companies to report annually. So the participants who do not communicate progress for two years in a row are expelled completely from the system. And this was introduced in 2015, 15 years after the UN Global Compact was actually set in motion. The recommendation for the action agenda is to follow uh, the example of the UN Global Compact to expel commitments from the online registry that do not report in a timely manner to avoid giving a false impression of action and progress. Then reviewing collective progress on a regular basis is needed to identify best practices, but also to understand the outcomes and impact of, of the global compact, uh, of the global <laughs> commitment platforms, uh, to understand how non-state and sub-state actors are performing in contributing to the platform. And best practices here include the annual progress report prepared by the New Plastics Global Commitment 
that illustrates outcomes because it's based on quantitative reporting as others are mostly based on qualitative reporting. Uh, the recommendation for the action agenda is to de develop a reporting and monitoring framework that enables to aggregate information to help measure outcomes. This is probably one of the most challenging uh, recommendations actually to execute because when it's about voluntary commitments uh, then you don't often expect to have a lot of commitments. It's, it's an incentive that it's voluntary and when you introduce commitments then it's uh, less of an incentive to contribute. And then come, coming to the ninth uh, function, online registries are used for show showcasing commitments and displaying collective progress online. It can also function as a platform for submitting progress reports uh, when stakeholders log in to that platform to provide their progress reports. And here the best practices include uh, the NASCA Climate Action Portal that functions as a meta portal. So it basically aggregates information provided by various data partners. So it's not only the Secretariat collecting this information for showcasing uh, what uh, the commitments are doing, but it's actually many partners involved here. And the recommendation for the action agenda is to develop uh, the existing online portal by introducing search filters and developing these type of partnerships to outsource very much of this data collection to leading institutions in the field. Hopefully when the action agenda develops, it will expand from, from the current 200 commitments to uh, the around 40,000 commitments in the Global Climate Action Agenda. And lastly, public campaigns can be organized for raising awareness of the general public. So these campaigns that actually then uh, commit individuals uh, might not make a significant change uh, that can be measured, but, but it is important to generate uh, awareness and, and, and then change behavior. Uh, best practices include the UN Act Now campaign that was launched in 2018 uh, with a call by Sir David Attenberg in conjunction with the award-winning People's Seed Initiative. And this has attracted almost 4 million individual actions on climate and sustainability. And when you go to the portal every month, you see hundreds of thousands of, of new commitments. And the recommendation for the action agenda is to launch a similar public campaign that can be a part of the action agenda to encourage these individual commitments from the public. And also here, maybe using a prominent figure like, uh, for example, Jane Goodall or someone who can actually then speak to the public. And lastly, uh, this is the last slide. So what are the next steps? So what needs to be done for all of this to get realized? <laughs> it seems like a lot of work is ahead, but these commitment platforms actually evolve over time. First, the action agenda will require a strong mandate from the Kunming COP to be organized soon. Uh, most importantly, the action agenda needs to evolve to a party-driven process by empowering the COP presidencies to lead the efforts. Uh, this is something that already has been done as the Secretariat has reached out uh, to uh, the COP presidencies to lead the efforts, but this has not been decided by the parties as it was decided by uh, the Paris uh, meeting in 2015 for the Global Climate Action Agenda. Second, uh, there is a need to deepen uh, the knowledge base so that parties are fully aware of how best operalize, operationalize uh, the action agenda. And this can be done by commissioning studies that involve academia or leading think tanks uh, that can produce analytical documents to inform 
uh, governments that are often uninformed and do not know uh, the decisions to make uh, to achieve a successful outcome. And lastly, the action agenda should actively seek partnerships with organizations, even unconventional partners. Um, this can speed up significantly the use of, of technologies, for example, for data collection and visualization, including through the use of artificial intelligence and so on. And as said, uh, this lecture is based on a report that was commissioned by the Swedish Chemicals Agency that is accessible online. And this uh, study was made to see how the global uh, agenda for chemicals and waste management that is now being discussed could introduce a similar global commitment platform, but very much of the lessons learned can be accommodated to any, any global commitment platform. And thank you very much for uh, listening. And thank you, uh, Nico, for this very interesting and rich presentation that took us across many platforms to comprehensively learn from them and also for deriving clear recommendations uh, from them for the agenda on people and nature. Um, in our uh, Q&A uh, box, uh, some uh, questions have been uh, raised and I will uh, uh, share with you uh, one question that has been um, liked a lot and, and, and also rephrased in several uh, ways. Um, uh, but it was originally asked by Elena Avellan. Um, uh, she says, thank you very much for uh, this interesting talk. There are over 10,000 commitments. Um, it would seem to require a large, uh, large resource needs to be made available to manage and follow up on implementation. Um, have you seen uh, such resources being allocated when the platform is first set up and designed? And is the resource programmed and planned for the life cycle of a, a, a platform? What type of secretariat resource is usually made available? Uh, thank you for this, this very important question. I think there is a real need to resource uh, the secretariat uh, with program officers and associate program officers. Uh, of course, at the moment uh, it is limited and can, cannot respond to the future demand if it develops like the Global Climate Action Agenda. That itself was also struggling with, with staffing the Secretariat because a lot of the time for the Secretariat went into organizing these different type of events, roundtables and so on. And I, I believe that lo a lot of this time should be spent actually in communicating and coordinating with uh, these commitments uh, to ensure that they meet the criteria and, and that they're actually then showcased and then removed if, if they are not active anymore. Uh, and this needs to evolve so that the secretariat reaches out to different partners also that can be responsible for, for this data collection, as I mentioned, that, so that the secretariat doesn't have to do everything. So finding these strategic partners from unconventional actors, uh, maybe like uh, Apple or IBM or, or whatever, then, then to be able to do a lot of uh, the work of the secretariat when it comes to, for example, um, data management and so on. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from Anupam Anan, uh, who asks, do you think too many platforms could uh, fragment environmental action? Also, again, a very good uh, question. Uh, when you look at the oceans, you already have three global commitment platforms. You have the Our Ocean Conference, you have the UN conference from 2017 that is also now a process because there is becoming a new conference. And then you have the Clean Seas campaign. So there is indeed fragmentation and duplication of, of work. And there is also already some academic thinking, you know, how to, how to merge actually these processes, uh, but they are led by 
very different people and uh, different, somewhat different political interests. So in practice, it will be very difficult or almost impossible to actually then merge these uh, different commitment platforms. But I see them also emerging in areas where the global governance is weak. So for oceans, there really isn't uh, dedicated conventions. I mean, you have the United Nations Convention of Law of Seas and so on, but it doesn't really talk to the conservation needs for the ocean. Uh, so yes, of course, uh, measures should be taken to avoid fragmentation uh, to make uh, the governance, if you can say, of these global commitment platforms as effective and efficient as possible. But in practice, this doesn't usually happen as, as has been seen. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from Professor uh, Haro from Asselt, and he asks, uh, who should hold non-state actors uh, to account for their progress or lack thereof? Um, who should be setting the benchmarks for biodiversity commitments and who should be involved in monitoring, uh, who should assess the overall uh, progress? I mean, you did come up with some recommendations, but is it enough that you come up with the recommendations? Who, who should kind of set those benchmarks? Sorry, you're on mute, Nico. So who should set these uh, benchmarks and, and criteria for non-state actors? I think this should be done ideally with an MEA uh, through the parties themselves. Uh, ideally, if you empower these high-level champions uh, that are then appointed by the COP presidencies as done with the Global Climate Action Agenda, they could be given a mandate uh, actually free hands to, to do a lot of things, including maybe set uh, criteria, or they could be negotiated by the parties themselves, which might <laughs> end up in a mess, or they could be prepared by the secretariat, uh, which is probably the least uh, best uh, idea, because it, it might not give them the type of, of, of guidance that is needed from from parties what is actually expected from uh, non-stake actors did i respond to all the questions uh i think so i mean there's a, a quite a number of questions um uh but uh one question i would like to highlight is uh from Harun Hassan Bashir, and that relates to developing countries. So uh, you, you outlined some principles, um, but maybe these are quite hard to, 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 um, uh, uh, to keep to for developing country-based actors um, uh, where resources are limited and there might be other priorities, especially during COVID-19. Um, I haven't heard you too much on, on, on kind of um, uh, inclusiveness, especially on uh, kind of north-south uh, dynamics. Uh, one thing is that across all these platforms, most of the time we see an underrepresentation of uh, the global south developing country-based actors. Can you um, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, the, 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 the problems maybe related to that and how best to uh, to 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 deal with them. Again, <laughs> a very good question. Actually, before I I did this lecture, I tried to do research and, and, and use the different search search filters to see the regional distribution. Uh, it, it wasn't always difficult, but indeed, it seems that many of these commitments are actually in developed countries. Uh, when you look at the action agenda for nature and people, it seems to have actually commitments uh, from all regions in a very equal manner. So there might be some thinking already behind uh, there that the Secretariat has reached out to developing countries and so on. And as I mentioned, the SIDS action platform is the only platform that is dedicated, especially for developing countries uh, where the SIDS often are located. And that is, of course, 
very useful to have such a dedicated platform for a specific group of countries. And yes, here I think also resources should be made available to uh, developing countries, but this can also come through the partnerships themselves. There should be more partnerships from the private sector, for example, uh, and that is usually weak in all of almost all of these commitment platforms uh, to tap into the resources of, of the private sector. I think that's something that really, really should also be looked into. It sounds quite fundamental, right? I mean, the, one of the reasons why you would have these platforms and engage all these actors is that you get more capacity uh, to do things. But if you find that um, uh, private sector actors, for instance, do not really commit uh, en masse, this does raise the question of effectiveness of these platforms and commitments. I do have a question here from uh, Maria Obale. Uh, who uh, asked, does, do all these platforms and commitments actually improve and protect the environment? Um, uh, according to Maria, the data shows something else. Uh, so um, why are these uh, platforms and commitments uh, useful or important? Uh, so coming back to that question, the private sector, Indeed, uh, there were two commitment platforms that actually have been able to attract the private sector, which was the UN Global Compact that is specifically dedicated to the private sector and the New Plastics Global Economy Commitment that is led by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And they both include this signatory mechanism. So this seems to be an attractive way actually then to involve uh, the private sector to have a certain set of targets to be reached uh, or certain principles or certain standards to which then uh, private sector uh, entities sign on to and for the UN Global Compact uh, the reporting is very qualitative but for the new plastics economy global commitment they actually do report very much based on the outcomes how they've actually then uh, uh, removed plastic throughout throughout the value chain. So this is something really to look into how they've actually been able to get the private sector to report on, on these outcomes. But as said, again, uh, when, when you look at those progress reports, uh, they don't show <laughs> real progress. But of course, the initiative is still very new. And over time, uh, there might be a significant transformation of, of the plastics value chain. And indeed, there is little information of, of outcomes and, and impacts actually what is achieved in the environment. And this is, this is a, a fundamental problem in these commitment platforms that the accountability and the reporting framework is still weak. I know there has been discussion in the Global Climate Action Agenda for years of how to actually have a more robust uh, way of, of reporting, but it's not easy, as said, because these are voluntary commitments. So when, when you introduce obligations, you remove the idea of them being voluntary in the sense <laughs> the incentive is removed. So I, th I, I think, you know, the reporting part is uh, important, but, uh, you know, um, uh, to stimulate that all these actors actually fulfill their commitments um, is a different, uh, is a broader question, right? So we have a question here from uh, Gibrila Kama, who asks, what do you think the global community must do to improve the fulfillment of commitments uh, in uh, multilateral environmental agreements, especially those related to tech transfer, um, finance, and uh, effective uh, technical and legal guidance to improve implementation. So the most important thing first is to have this strong validation of these commitments. Here, I think that our ocean conference is the best example uh, because they really screen these proposals and they don't just let anyone you know, 
make a commitment, it really needs to be very ambitious, very concrete, uh, fulfill certain successful success criteria. Uh, they consult experts in the field and so on. And when you look at these commitments, they also seem to last for a very long time in the platform because they are screened before they are posted. Uh, so this is very important. When you look at the SDGs online platform uh, managed by the Department of Social Affairs in, in New York, uh, it, it has a traffic light system that shows, you know, those that report, uh, those that haven't reported in a year, and those that haven't reported in two years. And it seems that most of these uh, are inactive. Um, so this is this is one of the most important things um, for this purpose. Thank you, Nico. We're nearing the end uh, of uh, this uh, session. However, um, uh, we have uh, one final question. Maybe if you could uh, briefly um, uh, 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 look at the question um, uh, or, or answer the question from Patricia Pedrus. Uh, she asks, uh, um, about the relation between these platforms and legally binding agreements. Um, how are these platforms affecting these, uh, uh, affecting legally binding agreements? I think this also relates to the broader question, like uh, it's nice to have a platform and all, but do, does it strengthen kind of um, uh, uh, overall governance or uh, maybe it might even weaken uh, governments. Maybe uh, uh, governments might find an excuse in, yeah, not to uh, agree on legally binding agreements. I think uh, the legally binding agreement is very important, and this has been proven for the UNFCCC in the last months. And that was this uh, climate change litigation case in the in the court of uh, in the Dutch court for Shell and and the court ruled uh, that Shell is not only you know needs to apply with the national policies but also with international commitments the Paris agreement and I think this is a very valuable case uh, that showed uh, that these provisions and targets of conventions that are legally binding may actually start to bind non-state and sub-state actors at the national level. So this means for Shell that it needs to increase its um, reduction uh, efforts sixfold to comply with a, with a court ruling. So I definitely believe that uh, having a legally binding agreement uh, can actually in the future significantly change the way how non-state actors actually then have to comply with these um, international uh, agreements, including the CBD. Thank you, Nico. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very insightful presentation and for uh, your discussion of uh, the questions raised here. I could recommend everyone to uh, look up uh, your um, uh, 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 report. Um, I have shared a link uh, in the chat uh, for you uh, to um, have a closer look at. Um, also, don't forget to register for future webinars. Um, uh, Bradley has uh, kindly shared a link in the chat. Um, finally, I would like to thank all of you for uh, uh, taking part uh, in this session. And uh, most of all, uh, Nico, for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.